Welcome to Defy These Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century. It is a project born out of my conviction that doing so requires an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding our complex world. I'm your host, Jiraya Yub, and in these episodes, I bring you conversations in the intersection of politics, history, philosophy, culture, science, and all the fun stuff in between. The following episode was first published for monthly Patreon supporters. To become a monthly Patreon supporter, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check the website for other methods. You can become a supporter for as little as $1 a month. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and family and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music of this podcast is by Tarabit. Here's the episode. The ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic has, in my view, made the topic of a, of a basic income really urgent. And my guest today is really well placed to talk about this because he's been writing about it for several decades. In many ways, he was among the first to even propose it on the global stage. A basic income is as it sounds. On a monthly basis, the state provides a certain income, minimal income, to every citizen. But there are lots of discussions as to, you know, the technicalities of it. How do we distribute the money? Uh, Who gets access to it? Is it unconditional or conditional? You know, and so on and so forth. And we do get into these conversations in this episode. But I think this conversation with Guy Standing is important for two main reasons. Or three main reasons, actually. One is that he proposes a new class system. That's not just what we usually think of, you know, working class, middle class, upper class. He speaks about things like the precariat, the salariat, proficients, oligarchs, plutocracy, working class, lumbin underclass, and so on and so forth. I think these are very important because I personally see myself as very much in the precariat. This is a category, a class category, that defines my life pretty well. I thought I would be, when I was younger, I thought I would be what a guy standing describes, a salariat. As in, you have a salary, you know, it's more or less secure, you sort of know where it's going to lead in a few years, you might, you know, have some kind of deal where you put some percentage aside and it goes towards a pension and, you know, and so on and so forth. But our generation, the millennials, and especially, or including those that come after us, Gen Zers and so on, don't really have much of that. Instead, we're getting more and more lumped into what Guy Steining calls the precariat. And so we discussed the precariat quite a lot in this conversation. We even went into a more philosophical discussion, or some might say a, a psychological conversation, about what he describes as the precariatized mind. That is the mental condition or the psychological condition that is that results from being in the precariat. Finally, we even got into his proposal towards a new politics of time. Because what the precariatized mind also does, it gives us a sense that we are always running out of time, right? Like uh, the examples I give, I get into some personal example in this conversation about how I've really had dozens and dozens of jobs and I'm not even 30 yet. I'm what you might call comfortably, uh, in academic terms, I've been going to like elite universities. I have very good connections. I'm, you know, as lucky as what can get while remaining in the precariat. And of course, most people don't even have the sort of access or the resources that I've had presented to me growing up. So this is a real problem. And I think that the global COVID-19 pandemic has really made that case for a basic income. So you will be hearing conversation between two people who essentially agree with one another. But this isn't really a matter of convincing you necessarily with that argument that there should be a basic income on a monthly basis. You may disagree with this for various reasons, you know, that that's a conversation for another time. But I wanted to have guys standing on specifically in order to talk about the precariatized mind, hence why it's in the title. I think if we get into that and we make that case pretty well, I think, in this conversation, including the conclusions regarding a new politics of time, I think this makes a better case for a basic income than any kind of quote-unquote purely economical conversation. So that's it for me, folks. Thank you for listening and take care. It's very nice to be talking to you. Um, I'm Guy Standing. I'm an economist. I've got a PhD from University of Cambridge. I've been a professor at various universities and for a long time I worked in the United Nations. 
Um, and <clears throat> I was a co-founder and now the honorary co-president of Bien, the Basic Income Earth Network, which we originally established in 1986 when we, a group of young uh, economists, philosophers, sociologists, activists started a movement that we believe should, should eventually reach maturity, that everybody should have the right to a basic income as a right of citizenship, if you like. Um, and I've been working on that over the years, and I've done pilots and experiments around the world. And at the moment, during the pandemic, we've found that an enormous number of people across the world have become interested in this. And we'll probably talk about that in the next few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. The pandemic has it's one has been one of my own personal trigger point of thinking about uh, universal basic income as well. So, uh, for some background, if that's okay, for those who don't who have no idea what we're talking about, what what is UBI? What is universal basic income? Well, the idea of a basic income uh, stems from uh, ancient history. Uh, I've traced it in a book about basic income, looking at all the aspects of it. Uh, to November the 6th, 1217, which was the day that the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, as it's called, were both sealed in Westminster. And they've become the foundational documents uh, of all democracies, if you like. <clears throat> and the Charter of the Forest uh, asserted that everybody, every free man, had the right to subsistence, the right to work, the right to a home. And you can trace the idea of a basic income to that document, and it goes through the ages. Now, a basic income in the modern idiom would be that every individual man and woman should receive a regular modest amount from the state paid each month in cash or equivalent, without behavioral conditions, without means testing, in other words, you don't have to prove you're poor or something like that, without work conditions, but as a right of uh, being a citizen. And it stems from the idea that it's a matter of common justice, that every one of us belongs to the commons. We inherit the wealth that's been produced by many, many generations before us. And if you allow for private inheritance of private wealth, which all states do, then you should allow for the fact that we should all have a share, a dividend on the public wealth, the common wealth that's been generated by those many generations before us. And we don't know whose parents and grandparents and great grandparents contributed more or less to that public wealth. And the only way to justify it is that everybody should have an equal modest amount and that it should be paid individually, not on a family basis or a household basis, with a smaller amount for children paid to the mother or the surrogate mother as a pragmatic decisions. And, and that it's universal in the sense that everybody who is a member of the community should be receiving that. Now for pragmatic reasons, I don't use the term universal because you would have to say that in a country, whether it's the UK or Lebanon or Switzerland, where we're talking now, uh, you'd have to say that migrants would have to wait for a period before they became entitled to the basic income. And you would only have usual residents of the country receiving the basic income. So it's not totally universal in, in that sense. Um, but but the, the essence of it is that it should be treated as an economic right. So that's the definition. Thanks for that. You mentioned being co-president of the Basic Income Earth Network, or BIEN, uh, and it emphasizes on the website, from what I've read, as you mentioned now, that the payments are unconditional and mm -hmm. without means tests and without work requirements. So these are these are details, but a very important one. And can you can you um, 
Can you explain why these specific components are so important? Well, I think, first of all, the unconditionality is, is important because you're saying this is a right. The right to freedom, it doesn't entail any conditionality except if you obey, obey the law. Uh, the right to fresh air, the right to live are universal rights, human rights. And a right, if it's uh, constrained by conditions that you have to behave in a certain way, is being paternalistic and is not consistent with being a right. That's the, I think that any condition you can think of will have arbitrary elements and be unfair to some people. It's important not to think of it as targeted. If you have targeted means-tested benefits, which many governments now operate as their welfare system, what you're saying is that only the poor should be receiving the benefits. Well, you immediately set up what we call poverty traps, because first of all, you've got to identify the poor, then you've got to say, well, if they choose to be poor, should they receive anything? Then you have to have tests of whether they're deserving poor or undeserving poor. And then once you've given the targeted groups, and every system fails even in doing that, basically what it means is that if you try to become non-poor, you lose those benefits. And therefore, it hardly pays you to get a low-paying job, the type that many unemployed would be able to get. So we have what's called a poverty trap. And what it means is that going from benefits that are means-tested to a low-wage job, you would face a marginal tax rate of 80% or more. That's the, the figure in Britain or Denmark or Germany. It's over 80%. In other words, they'd only, they'd only get a an increase of their income by 20% or less. So it has a huge disincentive means testing, but it's also arbitrary and unfair, and it never works very well. You have huge exclusion errors and so on. So that, that I also think, is, is an unfairness of the existing systems. As far as work tests are concerned, I think this is merely a, a device to control people and it is arbitrary. I don't know what counts as work. The trouble is today that only chase, chasing wage jobs counts as work. But the care work we give to each other, the care that women have been giving to families and to men and, and to the elderly, mainly women, that counts as work, that is work. It's the most valuable work you can get and do. But that doesn't get counted in the work tests that governments impose. What they're saying is only if you're looking for a labor job, a wage job. To me, that's arbitrary. It's unfair. It's unfair. And, and, and I don't think that's a matter of freedom either. So I don't believe in any conditionalities, behavioral or otherwise, other than obeying the law. That's a separate issue. And you shouldn't have the conditionalities which are paternalistic, and almost always unfair to some groups rather than others. But of course, with the basic income system, you would have to have supplements, special, extra, for people with disabilities or with extra costs of living. Because the idea is that everybody should be given an equal basic security through the basic income. And obviously, people who have got disabilities have extra costs. People who are expecting children have extra costs, frail elderly have extra costs, and therefore the, the amount given to those people should be adjusted upwards. But the basic income is to give people a sense of freedom, a sense of security, and a, an element of common justice. Working in your work, one of the things that really started to click with me is actually moving beyond the traditional understanding of what we would think of as the traditional class system, working class, middle class, upper class. And you uh, have spoken a lot about the precariat, of course, and you've contrasted that precariat with the salariat above them, who themselves mm -hmm. are, like the salariat are always at risk of becoming the precariat. 
uh, and above them both are the oligarchs and the plutocracy and underneath them all are the working classes and underneath the working classes are what we might call the lumpen proletariat, uh, lumpen underclass. Would you mind first like explaining this class system? Uh, it makes a lot of sense but it took me some time to properly understand it. And how would you say it differs from this more common understanding of class like working, middle and upper class? Right, well, I'm going to be brief here. Um, basically, my whole thesis has been that in the latter part of the 20th century, the last century, was a period where we know there was an economics revolution we call neoliberal economics, which ushered in a period of pursuit of a free market economy. But it was always based on a series of lies. We have the most unfree market economy ever, ever conceived nowadays. And it produced what I've characterized as rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income is going to the owners of property, physical property, financial property, uh, intellectual property, and less and less are going, less and less is going to people who rely on labor, on wages and other benefits linked to jobs. And in the process, the old industrial class system has broken down irretrievably. And what you've got is a class fragmentation where the really wealthy are receiving most of their income from forms of rent, from forms of income derived from ownership of property. So you have a plutocracy at the top of multi-billionaires, we all know their names, we wish we didn't in many cases, who have done phenomenally well and you know, they, they increase their wealth and their income during the pandemic phenomenally. And these are the ultimate rentiers. Below them is an elite of multimillionaires also making a lot of money from forms of rent. And below that is the group that you've mentioned, the salariat. Now, the salariat, when I was a student, we were in our labor economics courses, we expected by the end of the 20th century that the vast majority of people in wealthy countries would be in salaried employment with full-time stable jobs, with career orientation, with the prospect of a pension, with paid holidays, paid medical leave, paid benefits, this and that. And they would have employment security. But of course, that has not been the case. It's been shrinking all over the world, the salariat. But it still exists. And a lot of the salariat, people from the salariat, would be coming to my talks around the, the world. I've given over 500 talks on, on the precariat in 40 countries. And they would often come and they would say at the end, can I have a copy of your book? Because I want to give it to my son or my daughter because they're going to be in the precariat. They know they themselves they won't be going to the precariat. I'll come to the precariat in a moment. Alongside the 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 salariat in terms of income is a smaller group of, I call them proficients, people who are living on the hoof, making a lot of money, uh, rushing around, doing consultancy contracts, blah, 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 making a phenomenal amount. The trouble is their lifestyle means that they could go belly up and burn out at age 30 or something like that. Below them in terms of income is the old working class, the idea of a proletariat. These were the people who had stable, full-time manual jobs, often unionized, and the collective bargaining systems of welfare states were built for them by social democratic political parties, and the welfare system uh, was built for people in those circumstances. But they're shrinking everywhere. And politically, they've become very conservative. And many of them are falling down into this new emerging mass class, which I've called the precariat. Now, I wrote this book in 2011 called The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. And it's been translated into 25 languages and sold phenomenal amount 
a number of copies. And every single day, without exception, I receive emails from various people around the world saying, this book is about me and I'm part of the precariat. And the precariat has three dimensions. First of all, it has distinctive relations of production. What that means in plain English is they're subject to unstable, insecure labor relations. They have jobs which are below the level of their education. They don't have an occupational identity or narrative to give to their lives. They don't feel they're becoming something. They have to do a lot of work for labor, work that doesn't get remunerated or recognized in statistics and so on. And that first dimension is the dimension which many commentators have focused on in uh, criticizing me or writing about what I'm saying. For me, actually, that's not the most important part of being in the precariat. It's, it's an important reality. But if you had other circumstances, you could live with unstable jobs. You know, many of the jobs that people have to do, you really wouldn't want objectively to be in them for, for many, many years. So that's part of it. The second dimension is they have distinctive relations of distribution. What that means in plain English is that they have to rely almost entirely on money wages. They don't get access to non-wage benefits of the type that the salariat get, and they don't get access to rentier incomes, whereas the salariat actually do have property. The precariat is not only do they not have property, but almost, almost to uh, uh, definitionally, uh, they are living on the edge of unsustainable debt. One mistake, one illness, one accident, one bad decision, and they could be out in the street. They know that. And many people live permanently, chronically in a state of debt. And they don't get access to rights-based state benefits either, in the sense that, as we were talking about earlier, more and more governments are operating systems of means testing and behavior testing and so on, which actually is very hard for people in the precariat to to meet those conditions. So they, this is the second dimension. It's the third dimension, which to me is the most important. And that is that they have distinctive relations to the state. What that means is that people in the precariat feel they are losing the rights of citizens. They're losing social rights. They're losing cultural rights. They're losing economic rights and they're losing civil, that means justice rights, and political rights. They don't feel that the political parties or politicians are representing their interests and their aspirations, as well as their insecurities. So the ultimately, the worst thing about being in the precariat, and I, I, I have said this a thousand times, and still people, journalists and commentators, say, standings talking about people in unstable labor and unstable jobs. I say it again, the most important thing about being in the precariat is you feel like a supplicant. The original Latin definition of precarious was to obtain by prayer. And that's how it feels for most people in the precariat. You feel you're dependent on people having discretionary judgments in your favor. You feel as if you have to depend on charity. You have to depend on favors and being obsequious and asking and dependent on the goodwill of others, which is very demeaning. And as David Hume taught us in the 18th century, charity is akin to pity. And pity is akin to contempt. And this sense of being a supplicant is something that most people who've been in the precariat or are in the precariat, they know damn well what that means. And that to me is the most important thing. 
So the precariat is a class because capitalism, rentier capitalism, wants and needs the precariat to supply labor and work, and they are part of the system. Underneath them is a lumpen category that you mentioned, who are outside of all sorts of classes. They don't have a, a, a direct role in the process, but is growing. A large millions of people there are in a lumpenized character, in a lumpenized situation, but it's not the same thing as being in the precariat. The precariat is, is a functional part of the economic system of rentier capitalism. And that I, I, I emphasize as an important aspect of it. Well, you mentioned that many people have you know, come to you and said that this is me, this is my story. And in, indeed, this is why I'm reaching out as well. This is indeed my story. If it's, so I'll share a bit of my story, if that's okay. So I'm on my way to, to getting a PhD. I live in Geneva. I've gone through four different universities, all considered quote unquote elites. And I've actually went through my CV before talking to you just to make sure I wasn't exaggerating, but I've gone through over 30 jobs in the past decade or so. And what you've described, this feeling of not knowing what is the best thing to, to be doing with your time, this precarious mind, which I'll ask you to expand upon in a bit, is, is very much something that, that myself and most people I can think of that are roughly in the same age group uh, around the world, really, uh, are going through. And even before reading about um, basic income, universal basic income, it, it always seemed clear to me that without some kind of like financial security, this will be a reality. Like this is just a reality for the for the foreseeable future, if not like for the, the rest of my life. And for because for the past decade, especially, I mean, in, in my case, for some a bit longer than that, everything's been about the importance of networking, the importance of diversifying your portfolio, having a dozen different skills at any one time, able to uh, having, you know, uh, basically perfect yourself as long as possible and that is by definition an endless process you can never you can never perfect perfect it long enough that you move from the precarity to the salariat and then more than that let's say or at least it's not easy i've worked as a writer journalist editor researcher analyst proofreader translator photographer conservationist podcaster now and I've done consultancies on, I, I don't even know how many different uh, things and yet i'm still nowhere near um that let's say that goal of of stability of financial stability and that's what everything that i've just mentioned which comes which of course comes with its own sets of privileges even having access to that kind of education would in itself is in itself uh, a privilege these days um so and that's in addition to everything else never had a paid holiday in my life at, you know all of these things which i, I won't repeat now because i've just mentioned it uh, in previous episodes as well so all of this for me uh, on a like on a psycho psychological level leads to what you've described as the precariatized mind and I, I feel lucky enough that i'm able to put a name to it so in that case i, I can thank you because this this really helps uh, but many people i feel would just go through it and because they can't name it or they don't know what it is they end up doing what many friends of mine have ended up doing which is just blame themselves as insufficient they just haven't worked enough they just haven't developed enough skills they don't know enough languages they just don't have enough degrees everything is just not enough not enough so would you mind um sort of going through with us a bit like uh, oh sorry would you mind explaining this precarietized mind and how, how did you come up with it yeah i think the the essence of the idea of a precarietized mind is that people in the precariat feel they have no control of their own time. And they don't know what are the optimum uses of their time that could improve their situation, give them security, give them a future, or whatever. And therefore, there's a tendency of to jump between activities. Should I do a little bit more of this? Should I do a little bit more of that? Should I should I be learning? Should I be doing a new course? Should I be should I be networking? Should I be doing etc. And this lack of control of one's own time is extremely stressful. It produces medical problems. It produces mental problems, mental crises, and it, it produces a, a short termism in behavior and decision-making and thinking. And I think that the, the essence of the precariatized mind is you're always looking for a suboptimum way. And it goes back to the idea of being a supplicant. You, 
you feel, should I be doing this because it might lead to that? Or could I put myself in the good books of somebody or whatever? And this, this is leading to a loss of a sense of direction and extremely suboptimal use of one's time. And it's in the context of what we're living now, which is an era of insecurity, chronic insecurity that's generated by the economic system I was talking about earlier, plus the ecological crisis, the threat of extinction, not just to species and nature, but to ourselves, as we're seeing with the pandemics that are taking place, which is a zone of uncertainty. I'm an economist, and there are different forms of insecurity. If you have the old industrial society, it may have been dull for many, many pe people, but you could calculate the probabilities of becoming unemployed, becoming sick, becoming pregnant, becoming uh, having an accident, etc. And you could have social insurance or private insurance. But today we live in a time of chronic radical uncertainty. And what that means for an economist is that you living with unknown unknowns. You don't know the probability of an adverse event hitting you, hitting your community, hitting the nation, hitting the world, etc. All you do know is it is going to come. And it's in its, you know, this sense of unknown unknowns <clears throat> goes with a sense that the consequences of adverse events would be chronically serious, that you wouldn't be able to cope with them or recover from them. And it all goes together, this uncertainty, loss of control of time, being in the precariat, to create this mental dilemma, which the psychologists have taught us is is very damaging psychologically and mentally. If you suffer from chronic insecurity and this precariatized mind phenomenon, your mental bandwidth shrinks. Your IQ actually diminishes. Maybe you could recover it later, but it diminishes while you're in those circumstances. And therefore, you make suboptimal decisions because you're not in full control of your mental capacities. And that's one reason, in my view, for having a basic income, because basically, how can we hold people responsible for their actions if the circumstances in which they're having to live are diminishing their capacity to be fully rational? Therefore, we should give people that security. And then they can get some sense of control and diminish the precariatized mind threat, which is an existential threat, just not only to individuals, but to family relations, to communities, and politically we may come to that later. So for me, it's, it's a very, very important behavioral part of it, the whole development of the precariat. And yeah, indeed, the, the political consequences is also something that I've been looking at. And you, you described three different types of precariat, the activists, the nostalgics, uh, nostalgics and the progressives. Uh, can, you, can you explain those? Well, I go back to the book of 2011, uh, The Precariat. On page one of that book, I said, unless the insecurities and aspirations of people in the precariat are addressed as a matter of urgency, we will see the emergence of a political monster. And you will not be surprised, in November 2016, I got a lot of emails from readers saying, your monster has arrived. Of course, that was Donald Trump. And this is because I've depicted the precariat as consisting of three groups that you've just mentioned. The activists consist mainly of people who don't have a lot of education, haven't been to four good universities as, as you have or I had, but 
have been drifting from a proletariat or even salariat type of existence down into the precariat. And they feel a sense of loss. Maybe their parents had dignifying working class jobs in industry and so on, and they can't get that. And they get angry, and what they're wanting, and that's why I use the term atavism, looking backwards, they're wanting a return of the past. So their sense of relative deprivation is the loss, the loss of a past. And this group listens to the what I call the sirens of populism, the people who promised to bring back yesterday, promised to make America great again, or some whatever country it is, promise that they're going to get rid of the migrants or the whatever, you know, they demonize. And this part of the precariat have neo-fascist uh, tendencies, which are nurtured by the political manipulation and so on, and the circumstances. And partly because there isn't a political narrative offering an alternative. So that part is a danger, a part of the dangerous class idea. The second group, which I've called the nostalgics, for them, they consist mainly of the migrants, minorities, uh, people with disabilities. They feel they've lost a present. They feel they've lost a now. And they've lost a sense of a home. And of course, we live in an age when hundreds of millions of people in different ways, you and me included, are migrants. We live outside the zones where, in which we were born or brought up, and many for good reasons, many for bad reasons, many refugees and so on. And we don't feel we have a home anywhere. We are parvenu. We are passing through. And this, this nostalgic group is huge in the area. In the sense, they're victims because they're de they're seen by part of the precarity, the atavist part, as the cause of their problems, which they're not. And they are victims because they have to keep their heads down; otherwise, they get demonized, and everything is blamed on migrants. A category of denigration. We all know where that leads: racism and, and worse. If anything can be worse, but you know, a whole combination of, of negatives. Now, this part is not going to vote neo-fascist. It's going to keep their head down. They've got to survive. But every now and then it gets to the point where the pressures on which they're having to live become explosive. They just become too great. And then you have days of rage. But potentially this group could be part of the new progressive and the progressive part, uh, whereas the first part feel they've lost a past and the second group feel they've lost a present, the third group consists mainly of people like yourself, if I say so, mainly the young educated who were promised by their parents and by their teachers and by their professors that if they went to university or college, they would have a future. They would have a career. They would have a way of developing themselves. And they come out of university without that. Yes, yes, but without a sense of future. They feel they are denied a future. Now, this group won't vote neo-fascist, and it's looking for a new politics of paradise, as I characterized it in that, in that book and subsequently. And this politics of paradise has not yet come out. But I think the precariat has been growing and I'm actually quite optimistic because for a time, the atavistic part was the biggest part numerically. And that's why we have movements towards neo-fascist uh, politicians in the, la in the last 10 years, not just Trump, but in parts of Europe, Orban and Boris Johnson and people like that play on that old that old idea of we're going to bring back sovereignty and uh, all, the, all the wonders of didn't exist but pretend existed. Um, I think that the atavistic part has peaked. They're getting older. 
getting a minority and they're, they're, they're desperate. The nostalgics are growing everywhere, but it's the progressive part that is growing fastest. And I'm beginning to feel that they're, be they're becoming a vanguard, a movement, mobilizing, discussing, forming networks. Many of them are joining the basic income movement, many of them extinction rebellion, many of them gilets jaunes in France and, and, and various other movements. And it's, it's, it's taking time to get out, but that's, that I think is what is happening right now. I'm personally like fascinated by the fact that you, you talk about a, a politics of time um, and especially the need to have one for the 21st century. We need to develop a new one. Uh, this The slogan of this podcast happens to be tackling the 21st century and it also happens that my, my PhD is on temporality and so this is something that I, I rather obsessively focus on, everything related to time, politics to time, culture of time and so on. What albeit in the context of Lebanon, but these these things tend to have uh, universal applications. Uh, you've described the need to have a slow time movement to meet the slow food movement, for example. Um, can you sort of describe that, you know, like paint us a picture in some ways of what that politics of time looks like? Yeah, um, I'm at the moment um, trying to find time, if you like, to finish a book called The Politics of Time. And I think We've been talking about the precariatized mind. We've been talking about how people in the precariat don't have a feeling of control of time. And I have a concept which I've called tertiary time. If you look historically back at the evolution of our societies, you could you could basically conceive of time zones, time periods is a period of agrarian time. Agrarian time was your time allocation was determined by the seasons, the weather, the, the agricultural cycles and so on. And you had a, a, a flexibility built into that. And it made no sense to think of regiments of time zones and so on. It was very flexible, very localized time uh, time clocks as well. Then you have a period of industrial time. Industrial time with industrial capitalism started in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, where basically disciplined labor was done under the direction of the clock and the machine. We have Charlie Chaplin's you know, fantastic film, Modern Times, that life is was divided into blocks of time. Got up in the morning, you went to the factory, you went home, you go to bed. You have a period of years of schooling if you were lucky, 30 years in industrial job if you were lucky, or if you were a woman, probably 30 years as housewife, and then short period of retirement, drop dead. Blocks of time. We're not living in an industrial era globally or anywhere now, we are living in a period of tertiary time when we're having to adjust and we combine different activities at the same time. You might be doing some labor, some work, some play in the same period or being trying to adjust demands on your time in any particular period. So more and more people are having their lives shaped in terms of their time use by what happens off workplaces, outside labor time, and are trying to adjust. And this, as we said earlier, and it's linked to the precariatized mind uh, development, but we have a situation where people don't have a sense of control of their time. And a good society would be one in which we can have that control and not only have that control, but also have the capacity to be able to spend or use more of our time for doing the forms of work that we ourselves would feel would help in our development, help in our families, help in our communities, help with the ecology and so on, and less time in labor, in jobs. 
bullshit jobs, as my late friend David Graeber called them, where you are being, your time is dictated to you. You have to do X, Y, and Z. But not only that, you also need to go back to the ancient Greeks, where you have a sense of time for leisure, time for shole, time for for developing yourself in a participatory way through public action. And what capitalism has done, in particular rentier capitalism, has forced people to spend more and more of their time in either labor or work for labor or consumption, passive play, entertainment, some place for that, and less and less time for shole or scolle, if you want to call it. And this is the, the real challenge now, and I hope you're going to be addressing it in your PhD, and I hope that my book will help in that respect, is, is to enable us to spend more time in, in real leisure, which involves work and development and leisure in the classic Greek sense of learning and participating in the life of the polis. Because I think one of the worst things with rentier capitalism is that the education systems have been commodified to the point where learning how to think and learning how to be a cultivated, cultured person have, have been pushed down to being almost irrelevant. They're not part of human capital or getting you a job or that, and therefore they become marginalized. So you find that fewer and fewer people have an education in civics, in, in their history, in their culture, in their, in their arts, of, of their, their cultures. And this, of course, leads to political dilettantism, and you can easily be manipulated by the likes of Donald Trump and so on. So for me, the, the politics of time is, is an absolutely crucial progressive challenge of the 21st century. Uh, and how has all of, I mean, you mentioned during the during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is obviously ongoing, that this attention towards uh, basic income has at least increased. Would you mind expanding on that a bit as well? Yeah. Um, I've been working on basic income and doing pilots in actually four continents in over the last 20 years. And I've always argued that we would need some sort of economic shock before the potential was realized. I obviously didn't expect the COVID pandemic to be that shock. What I think we've learned more than any single thing, I hope we've learned, I wish more politicians showed they've learned, is that the resilience of all of us and the resilience of all of our societies depends on the resilience of the weakest and most vulnerable groups in society. With a pandemic, we're all vulnerable, or 99% of us are vulnerable. And we realize that. And we've learned a sense of humility, I hope, and a sense that we need to give people the security in which their, their morbidity can be controlled. They're less of a danger to themselves and they're less of a danger to society. People who are insecure become sub, subject to all sorts of illnesses, all sorts of frailties, and therefore are more susceptible to victim, become victims of pandemics. And we're going to see a lot of people who are insecure, being unable to withstand pandemic type threats. And we need to understand that therefore we should, must give everybody or as many people as possible a sense of basic security where their health and themselves can be in under better control. And I've been encouraged, I think that's the correct word, that in the past year, there's been a surge of support and interest from around the world. 
I made a, I made a, a video of the invitation of Massive Attack, the group. They, made, they asked me to prepare a text and they turned it into a, a musical video. And that video in English has been uh, viewed over 400,000 times. It's also been viewed thousands of times in Spanish, in Italian, in German. And it's been viewed all over the world. It's, it's not that I said anything. It's the fact that people out there have suddenly started saying basic income is part of the solution. And I think that it is wonderful. I did an interview with BBC Radio this morning because uh, the 32nd uh, area of Britain, the council, has just voted that they want to do a basic income pilot in their area. And it was overwhelming that the count, all the councillors, except one, but all the, all the rest uh, voted in favour of it. And that's been happening not just in Britain, but in places like Korea. We've had wonderful experiments in India this morning. Also, I was talking to the UN people in Nepal about doing a pilot, and another group is wanting to do a, a pilot in Libya, which I've often thought would be a, a part of a peace dividend, which would which would help rebuild the, the country. And I, I think that in different ways, people are coming to the idea that this, it's not a panacea, it's part of a new uh, social contract building. A part of a good society is you say, everybody needs to have basic security. And then as long as we don't have that, we will have endangered ourselves, whether it be pandemics, financial shocks, or crises, political crises, we need that sense of resilience, and we can only have, be resilient if we build up our capacities to be secure and free. So I think there's a, there's a, a lot of young people in the precariat. They get it. They get it. And I think that after the lockdowns, we will see a lot more public action. And I'm encouraged that, that the momentum is with us. It's there. I definitely agree with that as well. I think there's just an increased awareness of just at least trying it out, if not uh, wholly embracing it immediately, because many people right. have their doubts. But like speaking of that, just to kind of be, you know, I don't actually believe in this, but like as devil's advocate, to be fair, let's say someone listening might, you know, have doubts in the back of their mind. They may have gotten used to a certain way of doing, of doing things, or they have some understandings of how the economy, quote unquote, works. Uh, are there sort of these misunderstandings that you would like to bring up? For example, just to, uh, I asked some friends before chatting, like what are some things that you think might not work in cases of, 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 of basic income, for example? And some a friend of mine said like, well, what about inflation? How would that work? And uh, would it be for everyone? Would it be for no one? Would there be risks with that? Would there be, you know, kind of in, in, as soon as you propose new solutions, I found, uh, or potential solutions, people immediately try and find the faults before even uh, right. putting it in place. But to be fair to those potential critiques, let's say, are there, are there these misconceptions that you would like to, to tackle or debunk? Well, look, I've been, I've been advocating basic income and working on pilots and, and writing about it. And we've been organizing conferences around the world for 30 years. And I've written a book called Basic Income and How We Can Make It Happen. And I've got a chapter on the objections. And I list 17 objections that have been made uh, over the years. You just mentioned one, inflation. Um, the most common is that it's unaffordable. Well, of course, it is affordable because... We all have commitments to meeting the basic needs of our citizens. And if we don't devote our resources to giving people basic security, we've got a, a problem of misallocation of resources. We can afford it. And whether it's in a rich country or in a low-income country like India, mobilizing the, the necessary resources is actually much, much easier than commonly uh, claimed. 
The second thing is that, that why give to the rich as well as to the poor? Well, it's much more efficient and equitable to give everybody a right and then say, okay, we're going to adjust the tax system so that the wealthy don't get more or uh, more than they had before, and you can adjust it. It's much more efficient than trying to find the needle in the haystack, the person who's really poor. The one you've just mentioned is one of the 17. But it actually is, is the opposite. The problem we have at the moment is that our income distribution is skewed so that a tiny minority have access to vast amounts of the income and they spend on rich consumer goods and imports, luxuries and so on. If you provide ordinary people with a basic income, they spend on local goods and services, predominantly. And that tends to generate uh, demand, which leads to more investment and more localized jobs. We did a pilot in um, India, and we had nine communities where everybody got a basic income. And Sonia Gandhi herself said beforehand, Oh, well, they just spend it and it'll all lead to price rises. And we said, why? People want to improve their living standards. And once they demand for food or for services increases, guess what happens? The supply of those goods and services increases. People become more inclined to grow more uh, crops because they know there's a market for those crops because people have money to spend. And what we found after a year and a half is that actually prices per unit had gone down. So it was reduced inflation, but the incomes of the people producing the goods and services had gone up. So they were making more money, but the prices had actually gone down. And really, I make I, I claim that that this is one-handed economics to think that it's going to be inflation. Two reasons: one, you're going to be stimulating supply of extra goods and services for ordinary people, and 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 two, it's not it's not unusual that incomes go up and spending patterns change, and it is not there's not inflation at all. The other, the other common claim, the most common claim, is that if you gave pays people a basic income, they would uh, become lazy, they would not work, and they would uh, uh, dissipate it on bads, on tobacco, alcohol, sex, or whatever it might be that people think is the bad thing. But actually, that's an insult to the human condition. We all, or 95%, 99% of us want to improve our living conditions, improve the health and happiness of our families, our children, our parents, our communities. And actually, we found in our pilots, whether it's done in Africa or in India or in Canada or in Britain or in Korea, that actually people work more and they have a basic income because, A, it removes the poverty trap that I was talking about earlier, but also it gives people more confidence, more energy, and they take more risks in trying different things, and they they actually produce more with more confidence. And, and all the surveys that I've seen, and I summarize them in the book, show that that's, that's the fact. But it does have one beneficial effect that critics uh, don't like to admit. It would affect the distribution of our time in the sense that we would spend more time in caring, caring for our loved ones, caring for our communities, caring which doesn't get remunerated with a money wage, but which we would like to do. All of us go through life wishing we'd spent more time looking after our elderly mother or father and wish we'd spent more time with our children, learning with them, teaching and working with them. But we can't because we've got a demand for 
labor that we need more money wages. So I think a basic income would, and we found this, lead to people spending more time doing care work. And that's the second lesson of the pandemic. Most essential work is care. And at the moment we have care deficits and a basic income could help lead us to do more ecological work, more care work, more environmental work, and less in resource depleting, ecologically destructive labor. And I think that's, that's a wonderful prospect. I, I think this is the strongest argument for it in many ways. And, and uh, I often feel that those who are on the opposite side of this, who use things like people will be lazy. I think, I think this is more of an ideological conviction at this point than anything that's based on fact and a very cynical view of human nature. It's also, I mean, if, if they think that giving people a basic income uh, would make them lazy, well, I hope they will stand up and stop being hypocritical and say that all inherited wealth should be taken away because inherited wealth gives people a basic income, a vast basic income, and therefore they would be made vastly lazy and we wouldn't want that at all. So in that case, take away inherited wealth. But they never do say that. And, and that's, that shows the hypocrisy. But as I said, I believe basic security induces people to be more confident, more energized. And the evidence we've gathered and other people have gathered show that that's the reality. So end of subject as far as I'm concerned. So to kind of wrap up this conversation, can you recommend three books for our listeners? Yes. I, I mean, obviously, if you ask an author of quite a large number of books, and he's, he's likely to list his own books, which we shouldn't do at all. But the three that I would like to mention are all linked to my own work. I mean, I, I could list a thousand great books. I'm not choosing any novels or or artistic work, even though I could. So I'm going to link the three to my own sort of lifetime work, if you like. The first is Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. I think that book, which was written in 1957, was a wonderful call for this agenda that I've tried to develop ever since goes back to ancient Greece and it articulates what we most value as part of being humans. And it's, it ends up with a call for public action as being the defining human, uh, the human aspiration. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I don't actually agree with some of the details and, and where it treats work and labor, the distinction. I've tried to develop that in my own books, but it's a wonderfully inspirational, very scholarly uh, book. So that's the first one. The second one is a book that was written somewhat earlier, which is Karl Polanyi's The Great Transformation. And that, of course, is also about time, the things that we've been talking about. And it's about how capitalism developed with a, a disembedded phase in the 19th century with insecurities fanned by uh, capital finance institutions and produced growing inequalities, growing insecurities, growing crises, political crises. And then it could either lead to fascism, which he was writing about. The book was published in 1944, or a transformation in which a new progressive agenda would emerge. I found the, the framework uh, of his book very important. It's a bit teleological because he thought the, the, the solution to the industrial financial capitalism was welfare state, and that was the end of the matter. I don't believe that. I think we're going through a global transformation at the moment, and that's been the theme of my own books. But it's a very important book, and I'm very proud of the fact that I have bef befriended or been befriended by his daughter over the many years, and she wrote an endorsement of my book devoted to that subject. And I, she's often assured me that had he lived, he, sh he would have come round to the the sort of agenda that we've been promoting. The third book is a very 
idiosyncratic book written by a friend of mine. It's not a particularly, if I'm honest, he's a, he's a lovely bloke. It's written by a man called Peter Leinbau, who is an American uh, leftist. And it, it, the book is true to his character. It's a bit all over the place, but it's a really important, thoughtful, path-breaking book. And it's called The Commons Manifesto. And it goes back to the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, the sort of things I've been working on. I've written a book called Plunder of the Commons, which is a, a part of my work that we haven't talked about, but we haven't now, won't now. But, but it's a very useful historical book uh, written by a lovely bloke. And, and therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm actually pleased and nominated as the third book. Amazing. Well, Professor Guy Stanning, on that note, thank you a lot for your time. Great. Nice talking to you. This Times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com slash times. And if you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.